This intriguing, award-winning corporate image is titled Meeting a Deadline. In 2020, it received a score of excellence in the Alberta Image Salon of PPOC, that's Professional Photographers of Canada, as an out-of-province entry and was selected the best in its class. Then, in 2021, in the National Salon, it received a score of excellence in the editorial class, became part of loan collection and was once again selected the best in its class. So today, let's meet the maker and find out how it was created. Welcome to Award Winning Images Explained. My name is Manpreet and I'm your host. Today's guest is Steve Kane, all the way from Ottawa, Ontario. Now, Steve holds accreditations through PPOC, which is Professional Photographers of Canada, in commercial, corporate, fine art, and portraiture, and also has the Masters of Photographic Arts designation. He's the owner of South March Studios, located in Ottawa, Ontario, and his images have won many provincial, national, and international awards. So welcome, Steve. Thank you very much for having me, man. I appreciate this. So, Steve, there's not too much that I could find online about you. You're quite a reserved person. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Introduce yourself. Who is Steve Kane? Who's the man behind the camera? And how did he get started in photography? There is a story behind everything, as you will discover. And, and when people come to my studio and see my images, I, I tell them the same thing. Everything they look at, there's a story behind it. So we could easily spend more than an hour just talking. Uh, I got my start in photography when I was about 10. As the story goes, um, I'm the youngest of four kids. My brother is the oldest. He's eight years older. Um, I always looked up to him and wanted to spend time with them. Um, there was one day when, as I found out later, he was trying to sleep off uh, a hangover. Um, he just handed me his Nikon and said, here, I just put a fresh roll of film in, go shoot something and, and kind of leave me alone. Um, I spent the rest of that afternoon, not just walking around taking pictures, but actually setting up backdrops and getting props and table lamps and things and getting creative. And I have shot Nikon ever since um gave up on point and shoots after that because uh, uh, just being able to control what i do was was just fascinating so that's a, a little bit about how i got my start very nice and you've got some pretty interesting anecdotes on your um, uh, on your website there were a couple that caught my eye and I would love for you to comment on a um, couple of them. So you helped assemble the uh, International Space Sta Station. Um, Tell us yeah. about that. <laughs> um, I actually had a 30-year uh, high-tech career, the majority of the time spent in military and aerospace. Um, at the time, the company I was working for was a prime contractor to NASA. Um, when you're on orbit and you look out the window, mm -hmm. there is no depth perception. Um, there's nothing to refer to to tell you how large something is, how far away it might be. Our company had what we call the space vision system, and that allowed the astronauts to determine um, on orbit um, the relative positioning of an object. If we knew how big it was on ground, we could determine where it was in space in relation to the other modules they were trying to assemble. Uh, so that became a key element in, in how mm -hmm. NASA assembled the space station. Interesting. And you used to go to work by hovercraft? Yeah, part of what I did uh, was subcontract management. 
Um, there was a company uh, in Ryde on the Isle of Wight um, in England that I used to visit quite frequently. Uh, so I would actually stay in Portsmouth, walk down to the dock in the morning, hop on the hovercraft, take it over to the Isle of Wight, uh, do business, hop on it to come back uh, to the to the hotel. Um, doing that day in and day out for, for weeks at a time. It was uh, quite an interesting way to get to work and back. And the one that sends shivers up your spine is you had a ticket for a flight that crashed and you missed it, right? Um, I didn't miss the flight. Um, I had it rescheduled. Um, I was in Chicago on business. Um, the flight that I had been booked on was a Delta flight uh, from Chicago to Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh to Ottawa. And I called the office and, and had them reroute me from Chicago, Toronto, Toronto, Ottawa, because I knew Toronto had hourly flights. So if there was any delays or whatnot, I could always get back to Ottawa from Toronto, not necessarily from Pittsburgh. Um, I remember sitting in the, the airport by the gate, um, listening to or listening for our flight to be called, and it turns out the, the Delta flight to Pittsburgh was in the gate beside us, because I remember hearing the call for that flight, seeing people get up and walk to the gate and thinking, oh, that's the flight I was supposed to be on. Um, didn't think anything of it. Um, when I got home, I was actually traveling with a coworker who didn't travel very much. So I was driving him back to the uh, to his house from the airport when we arrived back here in Ottawa, and his wife ran out of the house and greeted him. I thought, oh, how sweet. He doesn't travel much. She's glad he's home. Didn't think too much of it until I got home, and my wife did the same thing. So then, and only then, did I know that something had happened on the other flight that I was supposed to be on. Um, so was it a close call? Uh, yes and no. But uh, I had the ticket at one point and, and exchanged it for a different route that I preferred, that's all. <laughs> um, that flight actually became one of the stories for... Um, th there There is a uh, um, Discovery Channel show um, called Mayday where they do crash air crash investigations and that flight became one of their episodes. Oh, wow. So. Wow. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> and to top it all, uh, top all that, you are also ambidextrous. Yes, but I admit I only edit with my right hand. <laughs> yeah, I heard somebody say I'll give my right hand to be an ambidextrous. <laughs> so meeting a deadline. That's the image we're going to talk about today. That is really a spectacular image. I mean, you, if you look at it, if you come across it in a magazine, you are bound to stop in the pages. Um, I love the way you played with the warm tones and cool tones. And I am really wanting to know how you created that, how you, how you came up with the idea. Was it, was it for a client? Was it for yourself? Uh, um... Again, every image tends to have a story behind it, and this one has a bit of an unusual story. Um, so yes, I was um, on a commercial shoot uh, downtown Ottawa. Uh, we were shooting out of a boardroom at the penthouse of um, one of the, the taller buildings down there. Um, if I looked out one window, I could see Parliament Hill. Um, at the time... Um, I was just setting up, this was a, in the morning, I was just setting up my equipment. It had wide window sills, so I was laying out what I needed for the shoot uh, along the window sills so I would have easy access. Um, this particular image actually has nothing to do with why I was downtown for the commercial shoot. Uh, I looked out the window as I was unpacking my gear and that was what I saw. Uh, this meeting taking place a few floors down in a a neighboring building um, and having come from a corporate environment understanding why they were there what they were doing I uh, just thought okay well I'll, I'll just kind of capture this and then park it and get on with why I'm actually downtown shooting and getting paid um, 
so as far as collaboration and setup and all this types of thing, um, this image was a single grab, an, an opportune moment that I saw, um, that I photographed, and then got back to work for the, the client that was paying me. You want to talk a little bit about this image in, in the sense like what gear did you use? Did you do it handheld? Did you set up your tripod? Uh, no, this was, uh, um, again, just a, a quick handheld uh, capture, single image shot uh, uh, in RAW and JPEG. That's typically how I, how I shoot. Um, it was an Icon D700 uh, full frame. Um, I used, I've got two of them. I use them to this day. They are an amazing workhorse camera. Um, uh, I think it might have been my 24 to 70 um, that I had. The building was quite close, uh, right, right across from where I was shooting. Um, but no, this uh, again was an opportune moment. Um, just a quick handheld grab. Did my best to get the perspective as, as best I could from where I was. Um, but I, again, had to get back to work for the client that, uh, that I was actually there shooting for. And I do believe you've got some uh, uh, post-processing uh, screen share that you're going to do? Yeah, let me call up uh, the original image and then start applying my editing layers to it to explain. Mm. Uh, all, all you've seen so far is the final image that was submitted for competition. Um, I will admit the... Mm -hmm. Um, starting point looks absolutely nothing like the mm -hmm. final image. So that is what I captured looking out the window um, from the boardroom I was shooting in. So again, this was uh, an early morning shoot, um, just getting set up um, in downtown Ottawa. Um, looked out the window, saw these people having a meeting across the street, took one shot thinking there's might be something there. Uh, I need to grab this and, and then get back to work. Uh, so that is the raw photo that I started with. Um, and then when I had time, I, I just kind of started playing with it to see where it would lead me. Uh, still didn't know if I had anything concrete to work with but as I started the the editing process I'll just turn on some layers as we go um, you can see one of the first things I did was kind of brighten up the people in the room I'll toggle that on and off so you can see I just needed to see the the people oh, come on get back on there a little brighter um, and then I realized one of the obvious things I needed to do was correct the perspective. Uh, again, I was pointing the camera down without a tilt shift lens. So one of the obvious edits was, was to correct that perspective. Um, and this, um, this process of, of refining this image probably took a couple of months um, because I really need to, to walk away from something and then come back and look at it with fresh eyes. So a, a lot of the subsequent layers that you'll see me turn on uh, was a result of me coming back, re-looking at the image and saying, okay, now this is bothering me, or now something else is bothering me, and just really fine-tuning what's going on. So again, this uh, was playing with the contrast, um, the outside concrete pillars structure of the building I just found too bright and distracting so I needed to tone those down. Um, played with some dodging and burning. What are the elements? All these reflections in the windows and shades and things that uh, that were part of the the environment. Um, so you can see as I toggle those on and off how I'm decreasing the distracting elements. Um, I don't know if you can see here, I've got two dodge and burn layers. That's right, yeah. Um, if you're dodging and burning something to 100%, you only get so far. If you then create another dodge and burn layer, it allows you to mm -hmm. take the image even further. Um, 
So through this second dodge and burn okay. layer, you can see I'm getting rid of even more reflections, more distractions. So you prefer uh, dodging and burning to cloning it out completely? Well, this is a combination. Um, if you're cloning something out, you need to have something to replace it with. If you want the element to still be there but not be a distraction, then you just need to really tone it down. So a lot of this editing is a combination of dodge and burn and cloning. Um, you know, the next time I came back to look at this image, you'll see that I now decided the people needed to be a bit brighter again. So you can see there's some more enhancement just on the people there. This is a very subtle thing. This is my unsharp mask. I hadn't sharpened anything in the image yet. Uh, so you really see the difference in the pillars, but it also brings out details of the people inside when I applied uh, the unsharp mask. Then another round of dodge and burning. Uh, again, I found that blind too bright and, and some other distractions. So as I turn this one on and off, um, doesn't want to turn on and off smoothly. You'll see how th these people become brighter, the shade becomes darker. Right, right. So again, it's all just a matter of fine tuning coming back a week later, two weeks later. Um, mm -hmm. and, and just kind of asking myself, okay, now what, what's bothering me? You get too close to your images if you see them all the time, so you really need to walk away. Right. Uh, the next thing was, um, you can see where I've cloned out a lot of the distractions on the outside of the building. Um, there's a, a light fixture up here peeking around the pillar and all these other things. I always struggle with how much of the original environment do I leave. Um, there's one thing to, to clean it up, it's another thing to actually change the building. Um, you can see a, a lot of the repair jobs that had been done and patchwork um, I decided to get rid of. It just became distracting. I really wanted these people to be the focus. So I had to get rid of those. Um, this next layer is quite subtle. Um, the laptop this person was working on, I found, was too bright. And, and there's a little piece of paper underneath the projector over there that I found bright. So again, this was just kind of toning down those little details um, because I found them too distracting the next time I came back to look at the image. So it was at this point that I thought, okay, I might have something competition worthy. And I started thinking about titles. That's part of the process is you need to title your images. Again, at the time my mind was, I shot this at like 8.30 in the morning. They, they showed up to work early. They're in a meeting. None of the other offices, uh, you know, nobody had, uh, had shown up for work yet. Um, so they obviously had something important to do um, that, that brought them together, uh, you know, early in this case. Um, so trying to ponder titles um, is kind of where I started to struggle and it brought me back to when I was actually working with NASA where there were times when we'd work all day uh, we wouldn't stop working until 3.30 in the morning um, get four hours sleep be back in the office by 7.30 the next morning and do it all over again because if you have a launch schedule as your deadline, you have to do whatever it takes to meet that schedule. So that's where the whole concept of meeting a deadline came from. Uh, but my frame of reference for doing that was actually the nighttime. So this is really what transformed the image is I applied uh, a blue filter to turn daylight to nighttime. Um, now it's a late night meeting, not an early morning meeting. Uh, and that really changed the whole, the whole concept for me. Um, and the final layer, again, was just fine tuning some details. Um, the biggest thing here is this woman sitting at the end of the table in the original capture. Her face is leaning against the pillar, it seems. So again, just paying attention to all the details, uh, I just had to clone her face so that you could see it and it wasn't merging with the pillar. Uh, and that became the final edit um, for this image. 
so you can see from starting point to finish point it was quite a transformation for um, for a random image that I captured when I was actually there to do something else yeah it's, it's brilliantly done I mean <laughs> thank you to actually visualize this final uh, result from while looking at the initial picture it's literally day and night <laughs> It literally, yes. So, so one of the things that we'd been doing in our Eastern Ontario branch was actually helping each other prepare uh, for competition. And, and so I did show this images to my peers here in Eastern Ontario and, uh, um, and some of the feedback uh, from their comments with fresh eyes uh, helped guide the editing that I did with removing distractions and and toning things down and brightening things up. So, um, you know, f for competition images, it's great to have a collaborative effort, not not just do it on your own. <laughs> yes, and that's what I really like about associations. Is um, you know, one plus one is never just two; it's way more than two. And it's great to have feedback and uh, positive feedback from uh, from your peers. Now, this I understand uh, also one you said in Alberta. Besides winning in national, yeah, part of my process is um, when I'm preparing for competition, I submit four in province. Uh, I typically submit four out of province look at the results from those two competitions and that helps me decide which four images I submit to national. Um, so this particular image I submitted out of province uh, to Alberta. Um, it scored an excellent um, in that competition and also uh, best in class editorial. So even though that didn't give me affiliate status at the national level because it was an out of conference um, competition, um, I knew that if it scored excellent there, it should do okay at the national level. <laughs> and it did more than okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> now, entering entering these competitions, um, winning awards, improving your images, I'm sure it has impacted your photography and the way you make images. Has it also had an impact on um, the way your clients see you or has it had an impact on your business? Um, absolutely. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why I joined PPOC was to differentiate myself from the competition. Um, people who are not members, um, the opportunity to compete, um, obviously having awards displayed in your studio, speaks for themselves. I don't have to say anything about them. Uh, and people come in um, and just see for themselves uh, what it is that I do. Um, it's worked both ways. I had one client come in for a consultation uh, a couple of years ago, saw all of the awards, spun on his heels and left and wouldn't return any of my phone calls or emails. I guess he saw that and figured, oh, you're way too expensive for me, and he left. Um, <laughs> I've had the opposite. I shot a portrait session last week, and, and the lady was saying, I, I can't stop looking at these awards. Um, I want to do another shoot with you to win an award. Um, so they, they, you know, a, a lot of the clients that come in for headshots and, and they end up coming back for, for portraits. Um, and, and when we get creative, some of those go on to win awards. Um, so she specifically said, I want to win an award with an image. Let's, let's plan something. So, so that was pretty cool. We'll see if that happens or not. <laughs> That's nice. That's really nice. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what word of advice, a quick word of advice would you give to a upcoming commercial photographer like yourself? Uh, I guess the biggest thing is commercial photography covers so many different 
types of, of imagery, so many different genres. Um, shooting product is not the same as shooting a portrait. It's not the same as shooting an event, um, whether it's sports or um, you know a company event, um, shooting in the field, shooting in the studio. There are so many different things involved. Uh, that's what's drawn me to it because I hate doing the same thing over and over. I want to do something different each time. Um, so a word of advice is you have to hone your skills in all of those different um, environments, all of those different uh, types of photography. You can't just say, hey, I'm a commercial photographer and only do street images. Um, that may be great for a niche, but it really limits the types of contracts that, uh, that you can bid on. Um, it's easy to buy toys, it's fun to buy toys, and sometimes you need the toys to shoot different things, right? The, the equipment for your product photography is different than, than a sporting event. Um, so it becomes an excuse to buy something fun, um, <laughs> but you end up using it because you need it. So, so yeah, word of advice, um, hone your skills in everything. <laughs> it's true, we are all, um, you know, have the problem of uh, uh, techno lust. <laughs> Again, I'm I'm still using D700s. They're they're old old cameras. Now, Steve, where can where can our viewers, uh, uh, you know, see more of your work or reach you uh, if they need to, you know, um, get your services. So the best place to go would be my website, southmarchstudio.com. Uh, from there, you can contact me, you can mm -hmm. book book me, you can see um, examples of corporate, commercial, um, portraiture, headshots. Um, there's also a link to my fine art site uh, from there. Mm -hmm. uh, links to my Facebook, Instagram, YouTube mm -hmm. channel, um, LinkedIn. Um, so that's mm -hmm. the best place to go, southmarchstudio.com. Excellent. I'll also put the links in the show notes. So anyway, um, it's been it's been wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Steve. You have given so much of your expertise and your time, and um, uh, I look forward to meeting you in person someday. Soon. Someday we will. Yes, so. absolutely. Looking forward to it. And if you've liked this uh, interview, uh, don't forget to subscribe because we have interviews like this coming up regularly. So make sure you hit the subscribe button. And till next time.